Bonnie has asked for five minutes before we start, so when he gets here, we will give him those five minutes. Okay. So it's now 5.03 by my time. <clears throat> we will start at 5.08 with whoever is here. Not in. We have a lot to go through today. Okay, cool. You said something about a document. I did not see any document sent in the chat. I sent a PDF. It was sent? Yeah, there's a PDF. All right. Thank you. Have a logo. Computer. I haven't see, I did not see it. I just saw a message. Can you see it now? You see that now? Let me go back and check. All right. Okay, I may have I may have read it accidentally. Okay, I'm saying it again. Okay. Sorry about that. Yes, I think I erased it. Yes. That was a document related to the value proposition. And then the other thing we're talking about is species loyalty. Everybody saw that? Thank you, sir. I'm just seeing it after. Great. Okay, cool. So let's wait on Bonnie. In five or eight. See if I can get a money. Okay. Sir, excuse me, I'm not sure if it's just me, but the PDF you just sent is like, a, it's only a poster, like a covering. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. It's just the logo, it's just the logo and the, the tagline. Oh, okay. No problem. And the other thing was just a hashtag.
Okay, guys, we need to start. Um, is Bonnie online as yet? All right, so off we go. Oh, Vani, right. You wanted five minutes, you have them. We're not hearing you though. Vani, your mic is on. He appears to be chatting with somebody off. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we're waiting, we're waiting. It's no problem. Whatever it is must be very important if we wanted five Hello? minutes. Hello? Yeah, buddy. Uh, are you hearing me now? Yep. Okay, okay. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Right, right, right. Yeah, sorry. I was on the road when I when I when I spoke, and my phone is dying, so a lot of things happening. Okay. Right, right. Let me see where I'm at now. This is my camera. I I I, I spent my time. Well, let me begin by saying that last the last week we before class really impacted impacted me more than it's obvious. Which class was that? Um, when um, when Steve wife shared. Oh, okay. okay. Yes. Sorry about that. I was having some disturbance there. No problem. Okay. Yeah, great. But um, I, what I felt to share with persons today is to be is to be sensitive to people's situation, whatever that is. Okay. I um I, I came from the hospital a while ago, and I have a nephew who kidney is bad, as in as in so bad he I don't know he's around twenty one twenty two, and he. With a kidney transplant, he will have to be on on um, dialysis for life. If you can, that's about he is about two thousand dollars a month. Yeah. And I did a number of things. So those things will make sense whenever you all get a time to reflect. Uh, you know, added with um, Chamzi on um, uh, I don't know cancer covenant issues. I think sometimes we may not be sensitive to people's challenge. And, I, and, and, and as, a, um, as a class going forward, as people going forward, I think it's important that we do that. I think it's important that we do that. And the, the fact that um, Steve White shared and shared, of course, shared some personal thing, I thought that I should share some some of my own personal challenges. Um, I don't know if Ms. Lambert is here. But Linda is on here. Right, but she will know that for the past two years, maybe two, I could say two and a half years, 
uh, in my own personal life, it has been very challenging. And basically, my supervisor who, who, um, who kept me up because of the, the own emotional challenge having to deal with um, uh, and it's less larger. And, and I'm saying this to say that whenever you may have thought that I missed a class, uh, if I miss, I think I miss, I don't know, I can't remember now. And, and, and maybe when people miss classes, not necessarily because of this, but sometimes they are dealing with a lot of um, a lot of issues. Right? They are dealing with a lot of issues. And, and, and sometimes, most of the time, those issues are not physical, but they are more emotional and psychological. I am saying all this to say that, that you know, one of the better, one of the better experience I had with, with, um, with lecturing has been this experience where I found for once that, that I met a lecturer who in my view, is understanding, um, well, is understanding, understand the realities of life, um, and, and, and really has been, and has become family, so to speak. I like to say that. And has become family. And we don't necessarily get that often, where our lecturers care so much about our own affairs. And I think it's something that we need to really not take for granted. And we need to also, we need to also um, not take advantage of that. Yeah? We need to also not take advantage of that. But also, as, as, as a group, we need to journey with people who are having challenges, right? I, I, as I said before, when, when Steve had asked about the first day of class, um, even though the focus, yes, was on the first day of class, I was happy to see Tamzi again. I mean, like, real happy. Because, you know, she, she became part of um, the ministry family. And the whole idea is that for each one to look out for each other, one, and two, to help bear each other burden. I know that is spiritual things, but to help bear each other burden. Because there was a time last year, um, and I said, Ms. Lambert will know, I was really dragging. You, you might have seen me come into class or whatever, but I was dragging this and all the, this and all the, um, the challenges, the challenges, the personal challenges. Um, that had to be put. And most of us are trained in some of those issues, but when it comes to our own families, a whole different, it's a whole different, different matter. So I just want to encourage us to appreciate who we have, who we have to share with us, to appreciate the fact that we even had um, a lecturer and wife who, who shared intimately with us, and to not to see these courses as just another activity that we do, but see them as also formation processes where we can help build up each other and be better for each other. So good afternoon. I'm sorry for being late again, <laughs> but thank you, Steve, for giving me this chance to say that. I don't know if it makes sense to anybody, it's good. but I say that. Thanks, everybody. Everybody will process it, you know, in their own way and in their own time. And I appreciate, I appreciate the sentiments you express. Um, you know, we have to pause everything you said. We, we will all deal with it, you know, in our own way. We will and understand what it means, what it means to each other. There are some microphones on still, please. Um, put Roger and Bonnie, the mics are on. Yeah. So, so I want to thank you for that. Vani, um, you picked up on an issue that is going to come up time and time again. Um, this is going to be a particularly 
trying experience. Anything that says group and combined effort is always going to be somewhat problematic. I think in one of the very early classes, I said that wherever you have one or two gathered, even in a marriage, you do not get smooth sailing all the time. It takes a long time to get things synchronized. So with that said, I want to move right into today's proceedings without getting into pausing what Vonnie said or what may have happened over the last couple of weeks. The two things I want to discuss this today, uh, I mentioned it in the group chat and I, I just want to go back to it. I want to talk about value proposition and I want to talk about species loyalty. I don't know if you all remember the class, we had a class, a face-to-face -face class in TAMCC where I mentioned this concept about species loyalty. And I said that one of the things that bothered me with a lot of these environmental groups, and animal rights activists and so, was that they always put our species as second and that there wasn't a loyalty that you see in the rest of the animal kingdom to our own species. And if you look at that hashtag there, how many of you figure out what that hashtag is at the end of the species loyalty piece that I put on, on the chat. Anybody want to take a, take a guess? Did you see the hashtag? Hashtag DLM. Any takers, anybody, anybody figure out what it was? How many of you saw this? All life matters, sir. There you go, there you go. There you go, exactly, exactly. When anyone working in development who does not, in my opinion, and this is just my opinion now, who does not have that species loyalty, who doesn't see it, everything we do in development is centered on people. Listen to me carefully. Everything we do in development is centered on people, right? And we must never get, I'm not judging this issue that I'm going to talk about now. I'm not making a pronouncement. I'm not judging it. I'm just saying that as a topical issue, it brings to mind the issue of species loyalty. And I'm a dog lover. I have friends who have businesses that revolve around raising dogs. And I know that people get very attached to their to the animals and, and the animal is part of your family and you know and everybody most of you in class have you know a pet dog or a pet cat or what have you i'm just saying that we always have to be sure that we remain species loyal i am not saying that you can't love your dog and that your dog can be part of your family but you have to get to the point where of course dog life dog life dog lives matter but People have to come at the top of that chain in all instances. Now the present issue, I'm not making a judgment on it. I'm sure there are three sides to that story. There's the Evans, um, the Evans man side to the story, he and his wife. There's the white family side to the story, and then there's the truth. So that I am not in a position to comment on whether it happened the way the man's wife said it happened, or the police moved in the way that it was alleged that they moved. But I want to refer you to the statement made by the head of the Bar Association that in all things, you need to be clear that you need to let the system deal with it. So whilst I have, I'm not against the protest, I'm in support of the protest. And if I were, was aware, I might have been part of the protest, right? But we have to be very clear that we get all three sides of the story so that as much as people love their dogs, people have paid a lot of money for their dog, and the dog could be part of your family, we always have to have in the back of our mind species loyalty. And it's the same thing I tell people who say they love turtles and who say they love whales and who want to save every turtle and who want to save every whale. I keep telling them I am all in support of that once you remain species loyal. I'm saving those whales because I think by saving them, you can make the planet better for us humans. 
my focus is always on the species that I'm loyal to, which is humankind. All right, so that is my little intervention there because I, I think it would be improper of us to have a class on development and CSOs and civil society and not talk about all this issue over the weekend. Of course, everybody knows this issue I'm talking about, right? The, the protests and the, the Fort Judy assault, right. alleged assault on, on the gentleman for having run over the dog. All right? So as I said, don't okay. really stand in this, in this issue. You could be a dog lover as much as you want. You know, I'm just saying that you must always, if we are going to be serious about working in development, development at the center of development is people. Now, as much as I love animals, as much as I like turtles and whales and everything else, the focus must be on people. That example I gave you all about the, the gentleman that killed the jockey from the street on the horse, I mean, that, that to me drove it home years ago. This was, this was in 1986 as well. How much? 20-something years ago, right? And it never left me. That's the idea that you know somebody would kill another human being from the streets in their horse. Then you know, I, I there has to be a way to join the line somewhere, because a lot of these people will go on to tell you that they're against the death penalty, yeah? you know, and that they're against you know the taking of a human life. But the circumstances, you know, when they get the heated circumstances, they, they they tend not to see the value of human life. Vani, you're going to say something. Right. 2004, post Ivan, immediately post Ivan, of course, we were at Red Cross doing relief. And I remember we visited a home. <laughs> I can't forget that. We visited a home. And that home, the people were sick, well, using rice to feed the dog, you know, cooking rice to feed the dog. And firstly, I didn't grow up loving dog. I mean, we had dogs, but I can I get to like them, but I didn't grow up a dog lover. And I thought at that time it was the most cruel thing and selfish thing. So here we in a post Ivan situation where people are hungry around Grenada and you taking rice to feed your dog, right? I couldn't understand that. And I mean, now I have some better understanding. But still, I, I really challenge with how, with, with, with how we, 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 we put those things together. The second thing I learned, though, is that I've taken your development is about people concept. And I'm using that as a, as a marker <laughs> to judge, for want of a better word, to judge churches and, so, and organizations. So regardless of how spiritual a church may say it is, or a group may say it is, if it's not people focused, then you know we are spinning up in what? In a sense, after you are attending that church, you have to be better. You have to be better. You know. So so thanks for that. That 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 development is about people concept. You know, I, I've been using it right you. You know, on on a no, not necessarily unrelated note. One of the, the most disturbing images that came out of the weekend, and that's, that's not about Grenada now, this is, well, in the US, was Vice President Mike Pence at a church service with a hundred person choir, without masks, without social distancing, you know. I, I, I find it hard to believe that you could be so concerned for my spiritual welfare that you're not concerned from a physical welfare. So I mean, in other words, it's as if you're saying, you know, if you have to die to sing for the Lord, go ahead and die to sing for the Lord. You know, and I, something about that just, just was very, very upsetting. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't fathom it. You know, I couldn't understand this evangelical zeal that you have to save people spiritually. And you're willing to sacrifice them, literally sacrifice them physically. Because I mean, he's gonna be tested every day. He has access to the best care in the world, allegedly, right? And you have a hundred people. I mean, and the thing with singing is that singing is about throwing your voice, literally throwing your voice, making sure you expel as much air, you know, and whatever else is in that air 
to the widest possible area. And they're talking about an indoor setting. You know, and I thought that was, I mean, of all the things that he has, he and his, his, his cohort have done, that I find upsetting, I find that was one of the most upsetting because, because of the hiding behind spirituality. You know, you can't be so Christian that you must go to this event. You know, you couldn't miss a Christian event like this with, with singing and what have you, you know, and put so many people at risk. You know, and, and especially since you're supposed to be head of the, 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 the American task force. So that was the end of my sermon as far as that is concerned. Any questions, comments from anybody else, including the hashtag DLM and, uh, and before we get into the value proposition? Anybody else had any concerns or take on it? Natisha, you picked it, you picked it up, so what, what, was on, what was on your mind? Um, first off, when I heard about the incident, you is the first person that popped in my mind with your saying of species loyalty. <laughs> so, um, but it also brought me back to a memory that I had as a, as a child growing up. Um, I have, I'm, I'm a dog lover. Me too, me too. <laughs> yeah, I'm a dog lover. I, 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 have to admit, I have to admit, I am, I am too. Yes. And I remembered um, that we had a dog home uh, and uh, when my dad packed the bus in the yard, one of the things he would go and do is to lie underneath the bus. So um, one day, he would usually check, but one day he was in such a hurry that he forgot and he rolled over it. <laughs> so we now coming home from school and mommy had to tell us the dog died and it's your father that killed it was, you know, we had our usual crying and whatnot and our little family um, funeral. Uh, we were upset with our dad, so asking him all of the questions of why you didn't um, okay. check. You know it's always there. But one thing I recall, I never stopped loving my dad or advice against anything about my dad because he had run over our, our dog. Yeah, yeah. Right? So that incident sort of bring back, brought back that memory, you know? And um, one of the things um, in regards to the incident, it's, it's to me as adults, I mean, and what's going on, why did we choose to take such an action out of every other possible action that could have been taken at the point in time? And that I'm trying to understand. However, no, in regards to the incident, in the, Russian, dog, in, the dog got run over. Why is violence you choose at right, the point okay. in time? Why was that the initial action? Why uh, out of all the other options there is yeah. in regards to questioning or taking a different route? Why was that what was resorted to? Yeah, yeah. So, and, 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 and right. let, me, let me remind you that I mean that is all of that is still a ledger. Well, yeah. Yeah, you know. So, so uh huh. So, but the, the the question that I have in my mind that you know, um, hearing the person from the bar speak, and you would have made a um, an, to it a while ago. In regards to letting the system take, take, its, take course. its course, right? And I was thinking to how we tie that in together with, um, you know, our CSOs and 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 so forth. Because if allowing the system to take its course at times can be a lengthy process, depending on how fast the system moves. The other question, the other thing is, if there is interference in the system, 
that prevents it from taking its natural course. How do we deal with that as persons that, you know, um, deals with people and, you know, from a CSO perspective? I hear you. I hear you. But I, what, what I was glad about is that we have had this discussion before an event like this. You know, I told you about my, my work with Specto. I mean, Specto is, I mean, most people would think that Specto is focused on turtles, you know, saving turtles. But that is not, that is not, you know, when we go on to talk about value proposition, that is not a value proposition that they bring in. All right? They are supposed to be focused on improving the lives and livelihoods of people in St. Patrick's. And one of the ways that it did that was by having the Levera Park, by having, you know, tour guides and so on, turtle watching, etc. And the beneficiaries there must always and should always be people. Otherwise, I'm really not interested in Spectre after that, you know. Because Spectre is not about protecting turtles. It's about protecting turtles as part of an overall support system for the environment, for biodiversity, and for people. So that if they didn't have discussions with the fishermen that would be in this place and so in, in Levera Park, then I would not be associated with that outfit or that organization at all, you know? And that, that, that is where I draw the line when I, when I talk about species loyalty, you know? But I must admit, I am a dog lover. In Trinidad, in the back of my house in Trinidad, there are two grave sites for two pet dogs, right? So I mean, we had full thing, the full, the full funeral, in, including the, the crying, you know, children crying and the whatnot and the whatnot. I mean, you know, so, so I, it's not lost on me. And I know that dogs can become part, but dogs and cats can become part of the family, you know, and you're stressed out if anything happens to them and so on. And that's how vets make all their money. Because I mean, you know, people spend a lot on veterinary care. You know. So the fact that you see somebody boiling rice for their dogs in the middle of a, a situation of starvation is no less arbitrary than people who could afford to spend the same money that, I mean, without, without drawing direct reference to your, your, your relative, there are people who are paying the amount of money that is being spent on dialysis on, on the care of the dog or the horse or, you know, or some other animal. I mean, there's no accounting for that. I mean, that is, that is personal choice. And you can't really begrudge people if they have the, if they have the resources to take care of their pet or some animal that they, that they like or love. Although I know, I'm not into the loving animals thing, and we should really know that we like things, we love people, right? I mean, with all these shipments, you hear me talking about my car and stuff, you know, I don't love my car. I like the car. I, mean, I don't love the car. I'm not going to, you know, jump out of my skin because somebody opened my car door and, and hit it or something. Right, Jeanette? Okay. So. Any more comments about hashtag DLM or species loyalty before we get on to the value proposition? Going once, going twice. Okay. So you're all cool with it. All right. Now, if you remember, in the course description for this course, um, CSD 113, I promised you guys that there'll be a general objective to expose you to the range of tools, techniques, and perspectives for the effective public recognition of your organization of interest. All right? I mean, we've had Raylene, Malabisha, People talking about you know, how they went about putting together, crafting together techniques or perspectives to literally market their organization, whether it be their private practice or CSO, what have you. But we got in that series on professionals who have been there and done that, we got it straight literally from the horse's mouth as to how you go about crafting these things. And 
although it's presented with structure, nine times out of 10, when you're actually in the midst of the thing, there is structure, yes. You do have a plan, yes. But you have to be prepared to be constantly rearranging, shifting priorities, depending on how things go. You may have, you may have decided on a logo that, or a tagline that everybody in the CSU was really hot on. But when you throw it out there, you realize that you missed a crucial issue on it and it didn't fly. Or you may have used a color scheme. I mean, if you operated in Jamaica, especially, you know, and you use the wrong color scheme, then you're easily identifiable now with a political party. I mean, I'm not, I'm not too sure how sensitive you all are to green and yellow here, but I mean, you know, if you had an entire marketing campaign that had green, you know, featuring to the exclusion of everything else, then you would not be surprised if other gradients told that, you know, it was, it was an NDC thing. I'm sorry, uh, NNP thing, or if it was predominantly yellow that people would think is an NDC thing. You can't, you can't stop that. And if you had no one in the CSO board or in the CSO committee that was sensitive to that, you could easily find yourself rolling out a program and then having to pull it back in within a couple of days because of that kind of perception, right? Because of the impact it would have had, because you were insensitive to the fact that political parties have colors and they are constituents out there who are always looking for a reason to brand or to, to, um, to link your brand with a particular party. Any questions, comments so far? Cool. All right, so that was the general objective. That is the general objective of the course. And I also promised you a few specific objectives. To provide the key features of a marketing plan suitable for a CSO. I mean, we spent a lot of time on that already. To present clear methods for the determination of the unique characteristics of a CSO. We'll come into that again. In our case, we were quite clear that, that your mission statement is where your full self are doing that. Right? That is what is so unique about your CSO. And to prepare participants to align the message to the core values of the organization. Again, your mission. The core values are always going to be determined by your mission. That is why we said when we were doing that section of the course or the, or the associate degree, we talked about not only what you're prepared to do, but how you're prepared to do it, the kind of ethical standards that would be in, implied in how you operate. And then the last one was to critically assess the value proposition associated with any marketing plan. And that's what we want to spend time on today. This whole business of a value proposition, what it is, how you go about determining it. And I'm going to give you this document afterwards, but to satisfy myself, we're going to go through it. I'm going to go through it with you now today so that I'm sure I can highlight the points that I think are going to be extremely crucial in this whole discussion. Now, the classic definition for a value proposition is a part of a company's overall marketing strategy, right? And this statement, if worded compellingly, convinces a potential consumer or client that your particular product or service adds more value or solves more problems than others offering similar activities. So in other words, your CSO is the bomb. Your CSO is going to provide all the answers or most of the answers or more answers than any other CSO. Hence the reason why you're saying that the value proposition of dealing with sister or whatever, you, whatever the, the, the CSO is, is because of this value, of this statement that you're wording it in such a compelling way, such a convincing way that all potential clients know of the bat. But here, you know, this is the CSO for us. This is the organization for us. This is the service that we need. And remember, if you're dealing with felt and unfelt needs, if you're dealing with unfelt needs, then your, your value proposition has to really dig away at the 
at the core of the issue, even if the issue isn't seen by, the, by a potential client itself. Are you with me? Have I, are you understanding what I'm saying? Anybody? Yes, we are. Okay, cool. Any, anyone has any difficulty, questions? There are a lot of cameras off here, so I can't see the expressions. I can't tell if you're, if you're with me or if you're just outside sitting down in the yard with a mask on like Michael. You with me? All right. You don't have to take no answers as a yes. So we with you. All right, cool. So we here. Now, the, the I am also with you thus far. <laughs> What's that? What was what was that? I missed that. Somebody was talking about whether they have any mask or not. All right, so this, this definition or explanation of a value proposition is actually taken from the web and it was posted just three days, two days ago. All right, so this is as current as any thinking is on the matter. So I, it goes on to say, what is a value proposition? A value proposition refers to the value a company promises to deliver to customers should they choose to buy the product or service. A value proposition is part of a company's overall marketing strategy. The value proposition provides a declaration of intent or a statement that introduces a company's brand to consumers by telling them what the company stands for, listen to me carefully, how it operates, and why it deserves their business. Now you see why I sent you that PDF. Like everything else, as I tell you, you know, when I discuss these issues, I try to take it from the people who have been there and done that. People who have actually designed marketing campaigns, people who have designed logos, people who have run companies. I'm saying that when Science Based Initiatives was launched, that was a most telling descriptor, that tagline. That tagline that you will be positively impacting the fate of the Caribbean. In other words, I saw the company as having Caribbean wide reach. This was not a Trinidad company or a CARICOM company. This was a Caribbean wide company. So when the company was launched, um, Suriname, when the Pion company was launched, Suriname was not yet a member of CARICOM, but I was already working in Suriname. So that the focus was on ensuring that we have Caribbean wide impact. I think Kenya in one of the discussions on the chat in referring to that interview I did in St. Vincent, one of the interviews I did in St. Vincent that was posted saying that very early on, I made it quite clear that my reach is Caribbean, that even though I'm talking to a Vincentian audience tonight or a Grenadian audience tomorrow night or Antiguan audience, that the perspective I'm bringing is a Caribbean-wide perspective. So that when I do a project or get assigned to be a consultant on a project, even though I may be doing something that is focused on St. Kitts and Nevis, I would be in a position to see, you know, what the likely impact would be on Anguilla. For those of you who know your history, the, comp the country used to be St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla, eh? used to be all three, just like you have Grenada, Kairoku, and Pity Martin. And it's as if Pity Martin decided, look, like, you know, we prefer to go back under the crown. We, we ain't even with this federal, this federal state thing, you know, let us secede. So back in the assemblies, Angola moved away and it, was, it became St. Kitts Nevis, but not St. Kitts Nevis, Angola. All right? So when you understand that, when you have that kind of, when you bring that value proposition, when I do work in Nevis, I have a level of credibility that is part of my value proposition. So if I'm doing a session in Nevis, as I have done sessions in Nevis, 
I understand the dynamic between St. Kitts and Nevis. In the same way that people who work here long enough will understand the dynamic between Grenada and Caracol, and Grenada and Caracol and, and Pity Martinique. And understand that, you know, just because you, you launch something in Grenada doesn't mean that everybody in Caracol and Pity Martinique has immediate access to it, right? You know, Tam CC operation, when you have online courses and things, Tam CC has to ensure that it has a, a facility in Karyoku, right? What happens to the, to the one student or two students in PD Martinique, right? So this thing about a value proposition has to do with how your organization, your CSO can solve problems and is best at solving those problems and is better than solving those problems at any other CSO. So when I, when I describe Nowadays, this is this the company is more than 17 years older. So that if that logo was developed in 2003, early 2003, how do I show that you still have a value proposition? How do I show that I'm really impacting the fate of the Caribbean? Their fate stands for food, agriculture, tourism, and environment. How can I constantly reassure anybody hoping to, to do business with me? How I do that is by further embellishing. Are you, are you listening to me? Are you hearing me? Let me just get some feedback. Yes, yes, yes. Right. So, yes, you heard the word how, embellishing. Right. How I embellish all of this. I mean, in a recent seminar here in Grenada, I was, I was hosting it as the, as, as the lead consultant in the, in the activity. And we were talking about branding, right? And I mentioned then that there are only three brands I take seriously. And not necessarily in this order. Apple. Apple, <laughs> exactly. Apple, BMW, and SBI, right? Which is my own brand. And I told them that one of the things that I, I keep stressing, and I, I did a seminar in Barbados a couple of years ago on intellectual property and branding. And one of the things I told them is that I put up those three logos on the, on the PowerPoint, right? Apple, which is recognizable, of course. BMW, which is recognizable. And SBI, which was, wasn't as recognizable because these weren't people in the agricultural sector necessarily, right? These were musicians and all kinds of people involved in um, the civil sector in Barbados. And what I told them is that you are judged by the company you keep. You hear me? You're judged by the company you keep. And I made sure over the years that my company kept that kind of company so that my vehicle has been BMW, my equipment has been Apple. And how do I link all two? I say, okay, when you go back, you never go back. When you deal with SBI, after you deal with my consulting firm, you don't go to any other consulting firm. And if BMW is the ultimate driving machine, SBI is the ultimate consulting machine. And by associating my company with those kinds of companies, you are judged by the company you keep, right? At an individual level, and a company level, and also on a CSO level. And that is where the whole business of an endorsing CI. Um, CSO comes in. You would have heard Abisha mention the World Endometriosis Association, the World Endometriosis Society. When you have an endometriosis society in a small country like Trinidad and Tobago, and you are affiliated, do you understand how the company that you keep gives you greater accreditation? Right? So the fact that this world body recognizes the efforts of TTA not only recognizes the efforts of TTA, but recognizes the contribution that Abisha has made so that she's on a world council. That tells you that, you know, you have a value proposition there that is very hard to purchase. You couldn't buy that, right? We couldn't stay in Trinidad and send money to World Endometrial Society and say, you know, you like this lady now, you know, or as, as, as my nuts partner and say, buy nuts from me now. That, 
couldn't have been part of the strategy. This was something that was developed based on merit and the kind of work that the society put out. Okay, so I'm telling you all this to say that it's one thing to have a value proposition that is written. Everybody can have a catchy logo, catchy tagline, but if you do not then associate yourself with one company, the type of company that will further legitimize you, so the company that you keep, the CSO company that you keep, the affiliate, the, 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 the organizations that you're affiliated to worldwide, right? And what gives you your legitimacy now when you go into a CSO or a group of CSOs and say, look, we are here to tell you about governance issues. They're talking not based only on your own value proposition, what you bring, but the weight of the, literally the people behind you, the people backing you, right? Any comment, question? Anybody didn't quite get that? I want to comment. I want to, uh, yeah, sure, Ronnie, go ahead. But I want to leave your CSO, your, 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 your talk, and take everything you just said there, mm -hmm. so, and take everything you just said, and place that within a legal context. Ah, nice, nice. I like that. I like what I said. Uh -huh. Right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I I can't I can't remember anything of a DM even even after all these years. You know, I can remember KFC, Southern Kentucky fried fried chicken finger looking good. Coke is it? Um, I can't remember anything of a DM. Apart from the fact that it's the airline of the car. Yeah. Yeah. Or that is leave I don't It doesn't even I mean. And the fact that the name is the 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 the, 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 the um the logo look good but the name is wrong, you know like yeah. leave what I learned in drum sport. Mm -hmm. So so the whole heap of stuff. And I, I I continue to wonder if because now that you speak about value proposition, I continue to wonder if because of it seems though a lack of good value proposition has not impacted the company. We know FedEx will get your stuff wherever you have to go. Mm -hmm. We know that. On time. Yeah. On time. Yeah. Right. But I don't know what to say about Leah. All right. Well, I am, I am really glad that you raised that example. The Caribbean airline. Yeah, it is the Caribbean airline. <laughs> but but tell, me, tell me something. It is more, it is more popular by the, by the derogatory acronym. Leave Island anytime. <laughs> right. Um, well, and, and some others that I don't want to share. You know, right. Other. Right, but so everybody has a, 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 a version of how they perceive Liat to be. But let me tell you something, Liat is an essential service, right? If they close down Liat on July 31st this year, by August 1, there's going to be something else in its place. So it's going to be like, it's like what happened, I was telling somebody, it's like what happened with, with Bibi, right? You have an airline that, is running at a loss, okay? Everybody's complaining, it's running at a loss, so you need to change, blah, 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 blah. But you have an airline with a client base, a customer base, a safety record, which is something that Liat has as well, right? Which is, which is gold, that's gold to airline. Eh? A safety record is gold to airline, right? So you have a good safety record, a customer base, or a captive, captive customer base, because when you want to go and renew your, your visa in Barbados, another, unless you want to fly down to Trinidad and Caribbean Airlines and then fly up from up Trinidad up to Barbados. I mean, usually it's a Liat, it's an early morning Liat flight. I remember how much controversy there was when Liat removed that flight because Grenada wasn't paying, allegedly wasn't paying, you know, what they're supposed to be paying. So see how, see how involved it gets? Now, why I like this particular example is that because we are facing that exact scenario right now. Those of you who watch TV over the, watch news over the weekend or whenever it was Monday or, or Tuesday, would have seen that the Prime Minister of Antigua is concerned that Prime Minister Mia Motley in Barbados has already said that she didn't want her shares in Liat again. Her shares are for sales. Literally, what, what she was saying without saying it is that, look now, me ready, I'm, I have no time with Liat again. Right? We put too much money in that and let somebody else worry about that. Right? So, I don't want to predict, 
but I'm suggesting that there's going to be a change that they have. They're going to come up with some fancy new takeover, right? They're going to either go the route of most government entities where they, they change it, they rebrand it till they are 2020 limited. That way you have a new set of documents. All the people that you're owing and so, you know, you find legal ways to, because the act as it exists now will not exist then. So all the creditors and they will have to line up somewhere else, right? Or they may go for a, a name change, but in the airline industry, when you do a name change, you need, you need a paint change too, you know? So that means you have to paint to all them in your craft, you know? And, that's money, that's big money you're talking. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure if they're going to do the, the 2020 bit or they're going to just come up with, okay, um, OECS Air, you know, right? OECS Air is one, you know. OECS Air sounds, sounds, sounds workable. But it's, it's more than just talking good. Eh? <laughs> the Prime Minister, the yeah, Prime Minister Brown said that he's going to leave it the way it is. He who wants to keep so? the name Liat, which I find is crazy, but that's who, said what he so? said. who said so? Uh Brown, Prime Minister Gaston. Brown. Yeah, he, not not only did he say he wanted to leave the name, he wants to leave it headquartered in Antigua. Now remember you're talking about a significant employer. Having Liat change headquarters is like having SGU move to um to a different <laughs> island. <laughs> that we hope we don't. We he said we hope that the Caribbean don't fight over it. Yeah. Well, yeah, but but he just he just jumped the gun, you know, by by knowing that they're going to fight over it by saying that. Because let me let us put it this way: if tomorrow morning Trinidad decides, look, man, if they are up for sale, we want to merge with Caribbean Airlines, right? Is there no way the headquarters going to be in Antigua? I think that, that, that stands to reason, right? So that if Liat is going to be a subsidiary of Caribbean Airlines or a, or a partly owned subsidiary of the Trinidad and Tobago government, there are no way that you're going to have Antigua getting employment. Well, it won't be an election year still because elections do in Trinidad this year. So that, that transfer wouldn't, t those things don't happen within a, a six, seven, eight months, right? So it's not as if they could get a transfer before elections in Trinidad. But they have no way you could tell the Trinidad public that you're going to invest in an airline and then all the jobs will stay in Antigua and stay in Barbados. Now that is a, that's a non-starter. A definite, definite non-starter. So you see the kind of monkey pants that, that Gaston Brown is in? So he jumped the gun by saying, I hope they, doesn't move, they don't move it from Antigua because he has a vested interest in keeping it in Antigua. Right? I think he was using language so that people will feel, the, car, the other leaders will feel bad. No, and no, 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 because he kind of hated, let me, let me he kind of hated that Caribbean it doesn't show leaders. unity. <laughs> Hello, let me put it. It's so backbited. Caribbean leaders do not feel that, right? That thing about appealing the conscience and things does not work. I mean, you all here in Grenada went through, when it was it, 2016, 2016, 2017, when Grenada stopped paying and Liat, this, um, Ralph and, and the other Liat, um, Shareholders, major shareholders decide, look, like, nonsense. We really ain't putting no money into this thing. We have cut the flights. And you saw the kind of hardships that gradients had to go through to, to get to Barbados to do their visa arrangement. They had to go the night before. They had to find a hotel in Barbados. They had to find a relative or a friend in Barbados or decide to sleep on the beach or something and then go to your appointment and then come back the next day. Whereas when they had the two flights, you could go in the morning, you come on the five, you come back on the at five to two on in, in, in the night at eight o'clock, right? So yeah. I'm glad you used that example, Bonnie, because it is very stark that the value proposition, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of West Indians, not West Indians, CARICOM nationals do not value yet. I can tell you that without even thinking about it. All of them will tell you, yeah, 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 close it down, close it down, yeah, they're not damn good. But all of them, they only feel the pinch, like, like the typical story about the water, missing the well when the, when the water runs dry. Missing the water when the well runs dry. Once the ad comes off the sea, you're talking serious, serious, serious hardship. All the people who didn't know that a lot of their quick pack and they used to come via the ad will now find that out. Right? So I see the ad as an essential service. I am almost certain that they're going to have another shake up. 
you know, people are going to rearrange the shares. Maybe some very clever um, foreign direct investor will come in, right? I don't know if how many of you are old enough to remember Caribbean, Air Caribbean. Yes, sir. 50 years. So I'm in Trinidad for the weekend and come back. Never yeah, forget. Yeah, yeah, go. I mean, they had, they had the, the most beautiful planes, you know, the most attractive stewardesses and things, which is the kind of things that I would, that I would remember, you know. And you, you used to have the, um, the, 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 the um, uh, like a little voucher card and uh, like a credit card and loyalty card and things, just like a big airline. And what became of them? Crash. Couldn't sustain it because you see, we need something that is a maxi taxi or a bus. What we need is that Airbus. We need something that will go from Dominica, St. Vincent, Barbados, and that is not going to be profitable. First, you cannot use jets for that. And that was the problem with Caribbean, with Air Caribbean. They were using jets and as a, as a pilot friend recently told me, just taxiing alone, I forget how much pounds, how much hundred pounds of fuel they use, just a taxi. So sometimes, once you see that jet take off and go to the end of the runway to, 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 to taxi there, there's you know, a whole set of fuel already. So whenever you hear that people have to, uh, a, a pilot has to come back to the hangar and so on, somebody had to explain you know, about all that fuel that just lost, it, right? That just used. So, so there are a number of underlying issues, but I think coming back to the value proposition part, it is up to Liat to really sell itself. And because oh, of the arrangement, because of the ownership arrangement, because you have all these politicians in charge, right? And to, to be the regional, to be the manager of Liat, all them, all them governments have to agree. So if they have, if Bonnie is a well-known, really, really good manager, but the Prime Minister and Antigua do like money. That is it. The decisions are not strictly based on private sector concerns. Once you have governments owning something, they're going to apply political pressure on it. And the person who becomes the general manager, corporate manager, whatever you want to call it, will always have to be vetted by, by the politicians. Who are the shareholders, right? And that is where the, the part of the fun starts. Okay, so in talking about a value proposition, it has to be something that is documented, but it has to be something that stands up to scrutiny, right? And as I said, thanks, thanks again, Bonnie, for bringing up that really good example. Liat is a perfect example, right, of what happens when I mean Liat runs, as far as I'm concerned, such a great operation. I mean, as somebody who has, you know long, several thousand miles on there. I can tell you that the kinds of issues they have to deal with are not issues that confront regular airlines. You have routes that don't make any money at all, right? You have out of the way routes. I mean, if you ever try to go to Dominica and come back in the same day, you realize it's impossible, right? Regardless of how they had ships around the the um the the, the 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 travel schedules you have some low traffic areas right but then the people in tortula need to be saved as well right puerto rico St. kids right all of these short drops literally is what kills leah because it means that you have so many different points of departure from your schedule. Just think about it. You have a flight like, um, let's say the actual night, that starts, Trinidad, sorry, that starts in Trinidad, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Antigua. But there are certain segments of that route that are really the money makers. Let's assume that the St. Lucia to Antigua part is the money maker. When you have two, three people coming in, in, in Trinidad, they are actually effectively taking up seats from people who could have boarded in St. Lucia. So I mean, I mean the, 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 the intricacies of, of, of trying to run 
a bus, a bus service in the air is really, really, really spectacular, right? And it's only when you, not that, that I'm a, a, the, the most loyal customer, but when, you, when you've been stranded on, on a Liat flight enough times, right? Another, another issue too is that when Liat is on time, that's an issue as well, you know? Because people get so accustomed to the fact that they, you know, yeah, that's true, nine ain't gonna leave there at six o'clock in truth, you know. So then you always see a branch, a bunch of people turn up at the airport with less than 30 minutes to do all the clearing and things. And I'm not talking about since the new protocols, I'm talking about in the old days, right? So that when they miss, when you, when you have a flight like, like the Ad 5 to 3 that goes Antigua, Guadeloupe, Barbados, Grenada, Trinidad, if you are coming from going down the train uh, from, from Antigua, and you happen to take that flight to three. I mean, there are four possible places where things could go wrong, you know, literally go wrong, right? The French come in and do the inspection in Guadeloupe all the time, which is always a time waster. Then you get to Barbados, they have to refuel and whatnot and whatnot and whatnot, so that is no longer, no longer a 15 minute stop. Then you get to Grenada, and if anything happened in, in Moise Bishop, then you have a, another delay there, and then you get on to Tiago. So that I understand that, you know, that they have, they have their work cut out for that. And I think that in terms of value propositions, they haven't done a good enough job of convincing us Caribbean nationals that they are not just an essential service, but essential service. And they haven't promoted their, their, their record to the extent. And as I said, I'm glad this came up here because I was looking for an example, a regional example that you know that would make sense to everybody. And if you look at Caribbean Airlines now in comparison, here you had BB with a perfect brand recognition. Right? People knew that BB logo, I mean, you know, I mean, I remember when, when BB used to fly to, to, um, to, to Frankfurt and so if you on a, if you in travel into Europe, and I mean, you get the fan for that, you look out that window and you see that logo passing here. You actually feel like you're home already, you know, because from the time you enter that flight, you start thinking you're crazy, you know, you're home already, right? And the thing had powerful, powerful brand recognition. Now, what did they do? Okay, so they want to restructure, they have debtors and things that they want to, to shake off, they have employees that they want to shake off, so they come up with the Caribbean Airlines. But have you noticed the flight numbers? The flight numbers are still BW426. BW601. Why? Because there are some branding things in there that you really don't want to mess up. You really don't want to mess it up. So although it's no longer BB, everybody knows the flight number is BW so 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 and BW so so so. There's no CA, there's no Caribbean Airlines flight 426 or anything like that. Right? So I'm saying that the same thing is most likely going to happen to, to Leah. And if we still Communicating and we still have a lecture thing relationship or any kind of relationship. I remember to, to remind you guys that I predicted that. Cool. But that's going back again. Hmm. You, you see, you share a whole heap of germ, hmm. right? That I really believe that Liad should have been sharing as a normal thing. No, no, no. If you tell the world, we are the only. We are the only, uh, we are the only carrier in the world. We are the only shuttle service in the world. I from Air Pacific. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, 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 what you said over the car? Air Pacific, Air Pacific does the same type of thing. You know, they have, they have all these little islands. Right. Like, they go, they go all to all these little islands. Right, right, right. right. So, so to, to me, but in this end of the world. We, in we this end of the world. To me, that's a serious value proposition. Of course it is. But I'm saying that, like, that was never that was never the focus. Remember the, these things are government owned. Eh? The government owned and government make a whole lot of money off of the ad, right? Which is something that never comes up, right? All these handling charges and landing charges and things. If you ever look at the structure of your ticket, when you buy a Liat ticket, if you more expensive port, than the ticket itself, you're for duty. Was that Kenya? All the taxes and fees are more expensive than the ticket itself. Actual ticket itself. Yes. So sometimes when they had arrange announces a ticket, a ticket price decrease and say, okay, travel to Trinidad for $100. That's not the cost of the ticket to you, you know, Brett. 
That is what they are charging as an airfare. When you put on all the taxes and things, your ticket might well end up being $210. And then people might say, you know, well, they are trying tricks out there. What kind of stupid is that? But they tell you that is that, you know, they, they are in control of that. That is the part they can control, right? So you're quite right, Kenya, that the, the taxes and other handling and service charges are going to be quite, quite, quite impressive. And if you listen to your, to your prime minister, when it was it Sunday night or whenever, talking about commercial flights, who is going to foot the bill for all this testing? That is why only charters are allowed now, because with a charter, you have already done the pre-testing in, in the UK or the US or wherever the people are coming from. But that is not something that an airline can naturally yeah, take. Flights are expensive. That means only middle class and rich people will be able to travel. No, I don't think not, afford, necessarily, uh, not necessarily, not necessarily, not necessarily. I mean, airline transportation has always been prohibited. Eh? It is only in the case of like a, a flight, a subsidized flight between Trinidad and Tobago, let's say, which is just $50. It's, you know, it's a lot cheaper to fly from Trinidad to Tobago than it is to fly from Greater the Caracol. As I found out the hard way, you know. Because yeah. when I thought, you know, I have something to do in Caracol, I figure, okay, I'll fly over in the morning, fly back in the evening. Same kind of thing you're doing in Tobago, you know. Because it's one country, I mean, it's not international travel. You know. So why it should be hundreds of dollars? Or well, just hundreds of dollars, right? Whereas in China, it's subsidized, you know, so. So it, 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 I'm taking your point about the expensive and about, about only middle class and, and, and more well-to-do people can travel. It has always been like that. That is why, and I'm going to be drifting into another area now, why intra-regional shipping is such a big deal, right? And we've we heard all these stories about the Dominican who built the boat who was supposed to, you know, there's supposed to be a shuttle service between Trinidad, Grenada, and Lucia, what have you. At one time, Trinidad said they would fund it. You know, they would use the, they would use some of our fast catamarans to do it, right? And the whole thing collapsed because of this whole business of the economics of doing it, right? I mean, I'm sure there are lots of Grenadians who would enjoy the opportunity to go down to on a Saturday morning, shop till they drop in Port of Spain and come back up Saturday evening or Saturday night. You know, once you don't have to overnight, you know, if, if, you, if, you're bored, if you're bored at midnight, remember you're still, it's, it's basically you're sleeping, you're sleeping on board, you don't have to find a hotel or anything, right? And if it's a, if it's a service, if it's the kind of comfortable service like you have, you know, for the inter-island thing between Trinidad and Tobago, I mean, you're talking about a recliner, a reclining cinema, cinema type seat, you know, I mean, with your cup holder and, you know, your big screen TV and thing, and, you know, so you're cool. By the time you get to Grenada, let's say half past three in the morning or whatever, you're driving home from on the port with all your curtains and whatnot and whatnot and whatnot. Okay? So, so I hope you'll, you'll, you'll see where I'm heading. Can I say a little bit, please? Sorry? Can I say a little bit, please? Can I make a contribution to Liat? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead, no, no camera. Go. Go ahead, no camera. <laughs> yeah, um, please permit me this afternoon, please. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Um, as it relates to Liat and, you know, not um, handling the marketing well and the, the, the value proposition, I think that um, it is something that I experience. Uh, as a matter of fact, I used to travel often and I experience the changes, right? Mm. Um, I used to get my, my frequent flyer miles, you know, and stuff mm. like that. But um, I experienced the changes in the, the way the breakdown of service, even the, the plane itself, you know, uh, was going through difficulties, even maintenance wise and stuff like that. There were one time I was like literally scared. I never felt like that at until I travel that particular period. And um, when um, when Caribbean airline came into play, you know, I felt a little bit more, re you know, relaxed a bit, but um, the one thing about Liat, it was always late, yes, but you know, it was coming, you know, 
<laughs> and you're correct in saying persons, if you're late for one island, what can happen in other places? So um, persons who would have been going on business, um, what they would do is many times they, 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 they would um, set a meeting or schedule a meeting very close to the time because they know it's always late, you yep. know? Yep. And sometimes when it comes on time now, then it becomes a problem. So I would have yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 I would have experienced that. So um, I believe that branding is important, value is important, communicating to the customer is very important because at the end of the day, you have to be in constant contact. They have to understand what you're selling, why you're selling it, and you must be able to keep that fresh in the minds of your customer or your consumer all the time. So... I, okay, I all right. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you said that you used to travel. How many times did you pick up your Islander copy and keep it? Uh, I that? never kept it, you know. I never kept it. You know, and, and that, that to me is, is, is the start of the problem right there. It's not that they don't yeah. have good marketing and good marketing efforts and things, you know, but it's just that, you know, the culture in the airline was never one of, you know, encouraging people to remember to take your, your copy. I mean, right. with, American, with American Airlines, I mean, you know, it's kind of understood that, you know, you pick up, pick up here and go. You know, and again, it. it goes back to, I guess, um, uh, marketing, maybe, um, I would say pricing, like, I guess class, because I don't believe that they could have afforded that. That's one of the reasons why they didn't encourage you to take it. Because well, no, but it says, it, says, it says on each copy that this is yours, this is yours to take it. Yeah, See, so, so I think that they weren't, they weren't promoting that. that. They were right. never promoting that. Was that no, I, no, I was saying I never noticed that. I thought they was there to keep me occupied until my flight. No, 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 no. If you notice, I mean, like like all in-flight magazines, there, there's puzzles and things for you to do. You don't want to do a puzzle and leave it. I mean, what, what, what were the people coming after us? No, no, you could take it, you could take it. But as I said, they didn't make it a big thing of, you know, of encourage you to take it if you understand what i'm saying right I yeah, but, took, I yeah, but, took, because but, I, um, go ahead chancy no saying i always took mine i knew it was something that you could take so i always i always took mine yeah because i mean they're, they're really 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 good stuff and good and, right. and, and as, part of, as part of my own marketing efforts i mean i always wanted to know you know what what I could put in there from stuff that we were doing in Winfrey and that type of thing. Yeah. Um, true, so because in um, I can recall, it's sometimes through this mag, um, this magazines that I I learned some of the activities that certain Caribbean have on what time and how they right. advertise it and, and so forth. But it never done on me was. I, I it was mine to keep. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I read it, and you know, no, take like seal and weed. I, mean, I am, I am obviously, but well, I shouldn't say obviously, but I think most of you figure out by now. I don't own a yacht, you know, but um, you know, seal and we can take an antigua. I never knew how vast and how big an event that was until you know going through the magazine and then happened to be in Antigua around seal and weed a couple of times. You realize it's big, fat, big. I mean. Well, Antiguans that love to fight like trains, yeah? so that when you got there, you realize that sailing week had very little to do with sailing, <laughs> and had more to do with partying and um and and and, and, and having fun down there, some dockyard and that type of thing. So I think we, we we're all coming back to the same point that the value proposition is something that has to be presented. It has to be reinforced. So I say it's one thing to come up with a catchy logo, a catchy tagline in twenty in two thousand and three. But to remain relevant in 2020, you have to now add something to that, right? So that as part of your marketing strategy, your value proposition has to be fine-tuned. Okay? Everybody? Cool. Yes, yes, sir. yes. Yeah. So now this statement, if we did compellingly convinces a potential consumer that one particular product or service the company offers will add more value or better solve a problem for them than other similar offerings. Now, if we go back to the Liat example, what, does, what, did, what did Liat have going for it? Okay, up until 2017, 
there was no other way to get to St. Louis, right? You could have gone to Becquery or the International Airport, but there was no other way to get to St. Louis unless you go via the other, right? Um, still, it is the only way to get into Dominica. There are no jet, there are no, the, 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 the runway in, in Melville Hall it certainly ain't jet, jet liner ready yet. And well, Kane Field is worse. Kane Field is only ready for they have their twin otters and that type of thing, right? Kane Field is really a beach, a beach runway, right? Which is the other airport in, in, um, in, in Dominica. So in terms of your value proposition for the ad, it has to be that, you know, this is, this is more than just an essential service. This is the only service. And what I found really interesting, Prime Minister Rowley, back in 2017 or something, went to a CARICOM meeting in, in Dominica. And he appeared on TV and talking about his shop that he couldn't get into Dominica in another Dominica easily, I mean, which I thought was really kind of strange because Rowley is a man who has traveled the Caribbean. He's a volcanologist and he's been up and down the place. He knows what the ice schedules are like. I mean, the fact that he was surprised that he couldn't get in and out of Dominica easily, to me, was, wasn't supposed to be news at all. It's just that now as he's prime minister, you know, I mean, he's not just a regular traveler. He, he probably figured that he should have a more, you know, a more efficient way of getting him in and out of Dominica, which there wasn't, right? Because you also have the issue of when you're landing Melville Hall, you know, you have that, that drive down to town, yeah? Which was the reason why most times I would take the five minutes of terror and, and go cane field instead, rather than take the 65, 70 minute drive from Melville Hall into, into Roseau. All right. Okay. So in terms of value propositions, he gives some, some key takeaways. He's saying that a company's value proposition tells a customer the number one reasons why a product or service is best suited for that particular customer. Point in case that we are using with Liat. If I am going to St. Vincent, according to the old people, that has no choice, right? Before that airport was built in Agar, that was the only thing I had to go to Honorsville. Plain and simple. And no jet could land in Honorsville. Well, jets used to land in Honorsville. I mean, Cuban military jets and things like that. But no commercial size um, jet could land in Honorsville. Right? So that, in terms of the value proposition for the uh, for Vincent or for somebody who's doing business in St. Vincent or who has to go to St. Vincent regularly, that was part of my value proposition. As somebody who was working and practically living in St. Vincent, I knew all the flight schedules and I knew any time that, you know, um, there were particular times of the year that you know that if you're coming from Antigua and you want to go down to St. Vincent and you take the late, the late flight, you can run into problems because the lights used to give trouble in Annasville and then you just have to bypass Annasville. The act would put you down, and that's one of the beautiful things about the act. They would put you down in Tobago and leave you there until the next morning, because you can't land in San Vincent. You can't land in San Vincent. They put you somewhere. So in those days, they used to fly to Tobago. They put you in Tobago. That's happened to me more than once. Lights ain't coming on and they take you down to Tobago. And now remember, for something that's happening in San Vincent, the act is responsible. The act had to find me a hotel now, eh? and then arrange transport for me for half past five or six, whenever it is in the morning, so that I could get the flight, whatever flight is going. I mean, I, I can write a book on, 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 on how the value proposition of the ad makes a lot of sense. Eh? Maybe I should think of buying shares in the new um, in the new Liat, all right? I mean, I've been on Liat flights already where somebody falls sick, right? And we weren't supposed to land in Grenada, and they land in Grenada. They have a, they have a heart patient on the flight, I mean, you know, person going into a career career. And one thing about the ad pilots, I mean, you know, I, I am so, 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 so proud of these for it. You know, when are the ad, the ad pilots just come on and matter of fact, you know, you know. Ladies and gentlemen, you know, we have um, a patient showing some signs of, you know, we, we think in a landing grid. I mean, that's just, you know, thinking a landing grid. But that time you don't make the flight plan and think already, you know, you think you're thinking a landing grid like that. By the time you figure it out, unless you're a frequent traveler and you, and you had built-in GPS, you know, you can't look down at the wash and water and figure out that we turn and we're going back, we're going green already, right? Yes. So they, they, had, they have a value proposition that I mean, I would say, you know, I hope, I hope, they, get it, I hope they get it right. 
I really do hope they get it right because it is a it is a very 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 essential service and a beautiful airline. I am most 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 impressed. I mean, when you talk about the value proposition of landing on on these small strips in all these countries, I mean, um, when when the ad used to go Montreal, right? right? They had used to fly to Montreal. They had used to fly to Nevis, right? They had used to have a twin otter service, and they have a twin otter service to Nevis. Eight minute flight from St. Kitts. But it was very, very useful. As a business person, you in St. Kitts, when you have a meeting in Nevis, take you there seven minutes, you're across. Rather than waiting on this scheduled ferry and blah, 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 blah. Right? Same thing with Montreal, right? And the thing with the ad pilots is that. I remember once a pilot came on in, in Manshat and said, um, you know, ladies and gentlemen, blah, 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 blah. And there's a twin out, there's a twin out there, so just, just what, 12 away on it. And my boy quite calmly said, you know, that you know, the prediction is going to be, you know, it's going to be wet, it's windy. And now when a lead pilot tell you it's going to be windy, you're supposed to button down yourself, tie yourself down with a piece of rope, you know, because remember the ad pilots, trained and operating out of Antigua. And for those of you who are familiar with Antigua, you could never land in Antigua without wind. So if a lead pilot tells you it's windy, that means it's something a little more than natural. And so said, so done. But I can't speak for the rest of the other 10 people or so on the flight. But I wasn't scared to the sense that, you know, I mean, I feel like a few people there. But I was concerned because if a lead pilot tells you it's going to be windy, it tells me that it could be windy, right? And windy would mean, you know, <laughs> something a little more than just a normal flight, right? So that little twin just start to dance all about this kind of thing, but I was comforted by the fact that one, it was a layered pilot seeing it. These are people who live and breathe and thing landing in Antigua. So where's that? I mean, and he did say so. Eh? He said, you know, we train, we train for this. Yeah. And you get that kind of comfort in the, you get that kind of comfort and feel from, from other major airlines as well, especially American Airlines. American Airlines, one of the reasons why I take them so seriously is that most of these fellows would have been army um, flight officers. So these are fellows who are custom flying plane with people trying to shoot it down. So just flying a normal plane against wind and fog and whatever and thing. Right? That is like they, the fellows could do that blindfolded, literally. And they tend to give you too much information, you know, like they'll tell you and what the reading is and fog and what the visibility is. And I really want to know all that. I just want to know that we safe and you know, we ain't gonna just drop out of the sky. So in terms of the value proposition for the earth, they have all of that history going for them, you know. And I'm sure if they did a proper survey, they have a lot of loyal customers. I'm not the only one out there, you know, who would have been with them through the years and know that, you know, that a value proposition makes a lot of sense. And as, as the government here found out as well. Because you notice with all, the, with all the old talk, we paid the money, eh? and that second flight became a reality. So that six o'clock flight to, to um, the seven o'clock, whatever it was, flight to Barbados for people to do their visas and come back on the flight to train the night became a reality once more. So just by the act, taking away the value proposition for a couple of weeks, and everybody started to suffer, then you know, the money flowed. So I'm hoping that the same thing happens. Um, when they do the restructuring at the end of July, or August, or whenever. Now, a value proposition should be communicated to customers directly, either via the company's website or other marketing or advertising materials. Now, I said that before we even started talking about the magazine, but here again, Liat Island I mean, is, a, is a quality product. I mean, if you felt the text, I mean, those of you who know about printing and thing, you know, I mean, especially you know, in a, in a, in a in a hard, hard copy era. Because I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, if Liat 2020 Limited or whatever it is they call it when they restructure it, comes back with that same Liat Islander, I for one will be the first person to write them and tell them that they bounce their head. Up. Because that is supposed to be an online dock with free Wi Fi on the flight and in the airport. So if I really want to scroll through the articles on it, I'm supposed to be able to take my phone and Airplane mode and download that PDF and read it on my on my phone. End of text. So that's how the money they spend on printing and all that. That's that's rubbish. 
right? So that would be my first piece of advice in terms of Aliyah 2020 or something. I see that Islander um, magazine. It was, you're correct, it was very expensive to print. Yeah, I know, I know. And, well, I it was good quality, because... glossy paper and heavy paper. Yes, and then the quality, the thickness of the paper too. I mean, I can tell you about that because I, I used to work with a company that was doing international printing. More, well, right. more, so, there's more Trinidad and more Barbados, so more international. Yeah. So, yep. um, I know it was very expensive and then they had not just the gloss, the picture, the picture quality was really, really good. The type of paper they use, everything, yeah. Color separation, everything, yeah. Mm -hmm. It used to be, yeah. it used to be, a, it was a, a very, 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 very serious publication. Now, and for those of you who remember me and my paperless, paperless philosophy, you know, that's why people like me wouldn't get stuck with that now, you know, COVID or no COVID. I saw the writing on the wall with paper a long, 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 long time ago, right? And even though some mischievous people and malicious people in the class would have mentioned that we went paperless and roofless and that we should only operate in the dry season, I want to remind them that, you know, my words will come true, you know, we will see what happens when your CSO gets launched and whether you're going to be operating paperless and homeless as well, right? Without a roof, a physical roof on your head. All right. So he's saying that a value, prop value propositions can follow different formats as long as they are on brand. You know what that on brand means? On mission for a CSO. Let me repeat. Value propositions can follow different formats as long as they are on brand or on mission. They are unique and specific to the company in question. I mean, how, how straightforward is this? Very straightforward, so in other words, if we brand it, we have to go according to the brand that we hold. So we have to live and we have to operate in our brand. But if we unbrand it, then we can vary it to what we do different ways. Thank you, sir. Yep. So value proposition can uh, a successful value proposition should be persuasive and help turn a prospect into a paying customer or client. Wow. Understanding a value proposition. A value proposition. <laughs> Sorry, who was that? Money. Yes, sir. I just wanted to ask a question. So I, I know where we're going, but but if is there something called a a semi marketing value proposition? Let's say with Liat now that that Liat now as in uh, June thirtieth today hmm. will release a statement tomorrow. Yes, we're liquidating new company, this time there will be a larger share of private holders. Mm -hmm. wouldn't, it, wouldn't that statement itself become a kind of selling point because one of the issues with me is the perception that, that politics. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm saying, can you push that to a certain point? I know it's marketing a bit. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. It is, part, it is selling the value proposition that that there's a perception that because it's governmental, but I'm saying that even to get permission, they'd have to go through Ralph and everybody else. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I cannot stop blowing Ralph. <laughs> oh my goodness. Ralph is my boy, eh? so do you know, I, I ain't bad talking Ralph, and I'm not saying that Ralph friend tends to be the more vocal shareholder. You know what I mean? Because he's very proud of the fact that and business and shareholder and yeah. we make sure he's put his hand on the scales you know when when anything happened because as i said up until 2017 he was dependent on for the life lawyer remember send um greater has Moise bishop in the right right so american airlines coming down here be flying here you know if we had there uh, you know it's only when it, you look at the barbados connection and the ease and the convenience that is when greater got stuck but otherwise, we could probably say, just like Bobby was saying, you know, well, Liat, come, Liat, go, I ain't got nothing to do with it, right? But Dominica can't say the same thing, right? No. And St. Kitts can't say the same thing because even though St. Kitts has an international airport at Golden Rock, the connections, the kind of tight connections, you know, it's just, it's just the traffic is just one way. What about all the Antiguans who want to go to St. Kitts? It's an American Airlines flight from Antigua to St. Kitts. You follow? What about all the conditions who have relatives in Antigua? You know, the whole, the whole long shebang. 
Yes, sir. It's always been very tedious booking flights to and from there. Um, difficult, difficult, because even when my sister lives over there, and well, she works and lives over there for over 10 years now, but even when I was getting the kids there, one of the boys was a bit too small to travel by himself, and I had to make sure I pay extra for the air hostess to, you know, yeah, carry yeah. him along. And um, <laughs> the thing is, we had to make sure we know where the flights were going to in order to know what price you should pay. Yep. Otherwise, you would have find yourself paying a lot more money than you should. Yep, yep, yep. So yep. it's very difficult to book flights to and from. Yeah. So, you know, so, so, send, so send kids and things had to worry, you know. Um, um, Dominica have to worry. St. Vincent has to worry to an extent too because as I said, you know, it's one thing when, what happens to the tourists who flies here by American to, to, um, to Grenada? I wants to do the second half of the vacation in St. Vincent or Young Island or something. There's no American Airlines flight from Grenada to St. Vincent. You know. Who do you think takes up the slack on that ticket? Liat. So with all the style we like to make on Liat and thing, and I say I'm, I'm glad that we get to stick on a on a on a private sector, public sector company. You know, so that we, we see that these principles don't just apply to CSOs. What you're getting here is an exposure to marketing and marketing rationale that is transferable to a private sector, public sector, or CSO. And in the unique case of Liat, which is private sector and public sector, sort of blended up, but it's more public sector than anything else. Because the people here talking are always the governments, not the individual shareholders. Because anything you open up the individual shareholders, if, you, if I have a hundred shares in thing, I want to go to board meetings, I want to be on the board. And I, I, I know need to stand to Ralph, and I know need to stand to, um, to Prime Minister um, Mitchell, right? So you see the kind of issues that will come up there, all right? Everybody? Yeah, but, but yeah, so yeah. That's, that's on, based on what you just said there, the blend of public and, um, and private always seems to be a shaky ground. Yep, always. So, uh, <laughs> that's the reality. That's all these also PPP, the way the all these you keep hearing about private public partnerships, right? You know, that is the fancy term now, mm -hmm. right? What and is, is to run up those offices okay, to, is to do government services? They're always shaky because it's very, very, very difficult for governments to give up that 51% shareholder. Why do think they want 51%? Because they want to be able to tip this Majority of the shares. They want to be able to tip this case. Yeah, they want to be able to see that. You see, Vonnie, Vonnie, it had no way of Vonnie going to be president flexibility, of this flexibility, or CEO of this company. Flexibility. Um, some microphones are still on. I think um, Glenda and somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, Natasha. So you're right. Any other comment? I was saying to so one of the things I would I'm have not hearing it, Glenda. Yet. Your mic is You're not hearing me? Oh, you don't hear me? You're too far from the microphone or something. I'm not hearing. You you hear me now? Yeah, I hear you now. Uh -huh. Right. I was saying one of the, the, the problems faced to by Liat is the way the government would pay their bills or not pay their bills were a big hindrance, you know, in them actually being able to do maintenance and service, you know, with the with the flyers. Of course. Of course. And um because also a lot of the um state well they use they use it daily to bring in the their own stuff from overseas and you're correct with quick pack and a merry jet and so when the stuff coming in most of them it's truly at and and stuff like that yeah yep, but yep, that's for yep, a fact yep. yeah but as i said you know that that doesn't go down well when the, the, the majority of the public has the ad down as late mm -hmm. you know, um scrappy service and too expensive but it's too expensive, not because of the ad, but because of the government. You know, yeah. That has been brought up time and time again. That's it. And, and, and the same governments that talk a lot about the service and things are the same governments that charge the, the, the fees. And so they move away from collecting the money at the airport to embed it in the ticket. So, you know? Yeah, yeah. Still, they move away from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one of the good things about, you know, by booking a ticket online and you actually see it, you know. You see that the flight is you know, $100 going to the yacht and $60 going to 
the, the airport in the event from another 60 dollars going to the airport you're going to. And that, and that, that's the reality then. Yeah, peeps? So I have a curious question. Go ahead. <laughs> How did you go about buying shares in Liat? No, no, I say if, if they put it up. No, no, I have never I never bought shares in that. I'm saying that if they come up with it. Okay, so you just you just caught my curiosity. Oh yeah, no, no, I don't have I don't have shares in yet. No. I don't have shares in BB either. Although I thought about it at the time, eh? but then when I realized that government would be um <laughs> because I'm a, I'm also a, not only a Liat fan, I'm a, I'm a serious BB fan as well. Right? Okay. You know, I as I say, you know, everything is a matter of perspective, eh? It depends on how how involved you are. I mean, Caribbean, no, I keep saying Caribbean Airlines, but really BB, because my experience with BB is longer than my experience with Caribbean Airlines. My experiences with BB have been such that, I mean, you know, I'm a loyal customer. It, it, plain and simple. As I said, I know the feeling you get when you go to an international airport and you see the logo or you see the insignia at a, at a check-in counter, you know? And you hear the accent of the people sitting down waiting to board. Are, are you all are you, are you hearing me? You all hearing me? Right? When you get to, yes, yes, we're hearing you. Get to that hub, right? Whether it's Frankfurt, uh, when when we used to go to Heathrow, uh, yeah. All the time you're amongst all these white people and uh, international and uh, Europe and blah, 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 blah. But for any time you get to that check-in desk. There's a different sensation used to come over you, all right? Because you're literally home, you know, from the time you board that aircraft, wherever that aircraft is sitting down, whichever tarmac, like wherever in the world it's sitting down, you know you are home already, right? Sure. And when that still has come down, the, come down the corridor, and in my head, I would have known at least one person on that flight, right? And you come down, you know, and that, that friendly greeting and the fact that, you know, apart from the fact that you could get bumped up, you know, which is, which is always a pleasure, or you're getting special service, you know, because if you happen to know the stewardesses, I mean, clearly, you know, and I don't drink, but I mean, you know that you're going to get, you know, first class treatment, even if they don't move it to first class, right? I remember being, I was in Jamaica the week before Gilbert struck, right? And even in 1988, you know, you had lots of advanced warning and things, you know, they knew that, you know, there was a big storm coming on soon. And I remember the race, because it was actually a race to get out of Jamaica, you know. And the thing is that you knew, you had a sense as a trainee that once you turn up in that airport to get on a BB flight, if only two people go in, it's you and somebody else, right? I used to get the same feeling in Guyana, right? That Guyana flight used to be a rough, rough flight. Eh? When I say rough, in terms of the number of people and the amount of load, because I mean, there's a lot of trafficking going on between Guyana and Trinidad. So it wasn't uncommon for for somebody to meet you in the line because check-in time used to be minutes to four, right? And never forget that, minutes to four. So CARICOM, if you're doing work for CARICOM also, CARICOM will send a driver for you, half past three in your hotel. Drive you out to Mary. And when you get there now, all kind of people, all kind of hucksters and thing, everybody coming to you. Talbot, you have all your weight? You know, Talbot, you could take some weight? You know what I mean? And you had to be there busy, busy telling them, you know, here now. But my stock thing used to be, I work for UE and UE does not allow that. End of discussion, right? So whether they come in and hand you money and you know, tell you, and then <laughs> I remember standing up in line, <clears throat> and this is in the, in the, in the old days of, of um, Diana's airport, eh? so the lineup was, you know, literally, under covered area, but you're exposed to the elements in terms of the cold breeze and things that early morning. And I remember standing in line, you know, for check-in. Not, not for check-in, to actually get into the, to the airport itself, right? And to get to the first counter. And all I would do is just like step out of line, you know? Step out of line so that 
somebody from the front could see me and then step back in line. And nine times out of 10, it would be either be somebody I know from being on the flight, you know, being on the flight like early, or I wait until about five people from the, from the counter and say something. So they pick up that Trini accent one time. And I know that if only two more people get on that flight, it's me and somebody else, right? So, so in terms of value propositions and, and loyalty, I think it comes from your experience with the brand. And my experiences with BB have always been good. I mean, of course, they lose my bag and thing already, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, it's just more than smooth sailing. But even when they lose my bag, you know, I am happy that they bring me, they bring me back safe, right? It's one thing for my bag to go on a tour. I don't want to go on a tour, right? So uh, they compensate me for my bag or they do find the bag, you know, long after. But that has happened to me with bigger airlines, TAM airlines and they lose my bag and thing, you know. So you, know, you end up in a, in a European country with, with just the clothes on your back and the underwear and thing in your computer bag because once you're a regular traveler, you know that you have to be prepared for your bag going somewhere else, right? And if you have a conference to go to and then you don't have your jacket or whatever it is over your shoulder or in a, or in a, a suit bag, then you better be prepared to do that conference in a t-shirt, right? Okay, so now I'm going to prepare this document and give it to you. We are close to seven o'clock and like I said, I'm not the type of person that you all could take for more than an hour and a half at a time. But I want you to read this, this document because your next assignment, which thankfully would be an individual assignment, and this last thing I have to say tonight, would be an individual assignment would be based on this value proposition talk. Yeah? So if your thoughts was just old talk and thing, brace yourself because the next question that you have to do that we'll be discussing on Tuesday has to do with value proposition. And so I, 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 I repeat, I repeat, it's going to be an individual affair. Oh, I must mention that I had to pull a lot of strings to make sure that we do have a final exam. Because you notice, thus far, we have not had any final exams. I do not believe in paper and pencil tests. I told you all that a million times, right? My job is not to find which one of you has the best and better memory and which one of you could cram the best. I am interested in making sure that all 25 or 26, or how many of you, do the course, leave with a full appreciation of the course in terms of its real life significance to running a CSO, right? I'm really not interested if you're very good at answering questions, if you're good at choosing multiple point extensions, or any, mini, mini, more, whatever system you use. And I don't care if you have a good memory and you could cram and you do exams well, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in putting you through the stress, and I'm, I'm repeating it now, through the stress of a group project which I'm sure all of you found out about, you know, and um, I can tell you that I planned it so that none of it is a surprise to me. So if you have difficulties, too bad. I am putting you on notice that that is what real life is about. In real life situations, you have to do group projects and there will always be tensions and all kinds of things in a group project. I really don't care. I am interested in doing that. And I had to argue with Dr. Telesford and Mrs. Alexander to be sure that my way of, of, of testing you people, assessing you people as to whether you should go on in this scholarship program is to put you through the rigors. And I mean that, eh? rigor as in close to rigor mortis, rigor of a group project, right? And I'm sure you had fun with it. I don't want to hear the answers now, but I'm sure you had fun with it and you're going to continue to have fun with it until it's due. And then you have two individual assignments. So that group thing is worth 40. 40% and the two assignments that I'm going to give you are 30 each. The remaining two are two individual assignments and they are not tests, right? I am not interested in, as I say, how good your memory is. I want to know how well you conceptualize what we talk about in class. So the questions are going to be very, very, very straightforward, point form things. They're not going to take more than 20 minutes to answer. So it's not as if I'm stressing you out. So if I give you that question, next week's question, on Tuesday, if I give it to you by 7 o'clock, by 8 o'clock, which is end of the class, schedule end of the class, you should have finished it already and email it off to me and get it 30% and go on about your business. And on that note, that is all I want to say for this evening.
any questions, comments, critiques on my methodology? Only one comment. But even if you have, oh, if you have, 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 have a critique, just remember that, you know, the most that they have here is that you get a G, eh? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Only one comment. Yeah, buddy. It's supposed to be a joke. Okay, well, thanks for being there, 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 There's a warrant away from Trump. <laughs> yes, oh, yes, 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 yes. I saw that from Iran. Yeah. Iran is your warrant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that is a joke, isn't it? <laughs> it is funny. It is funny. It is funny. Yeah. Natisha, you want to say something? Yes, sir. I have a lot to say. All of a sudden, I was winding down when the two assignment come out of the blues. You no, know, no, you, you didn't. You don't listen to me, or how, how long I said it was going to take? <laughs> yes, I heard you say twenty minutes. <laughs> right. Anybody who was, following, who was following the course and is into this course will have no difficulty at all. It's not something that you have to research like, like the current people that I hear you all working on. <laughs> Anyhow, sir, I, I just I wanted to add. I I just wanted to add, sir. Um, you I say I see you ranting and rave about you don't care and you know, but I would counter attack. About, about here and here. About the, re the reason the reason the reason why you're doing it is because you care. Well, yeah, that's arguable, but I mean, you know, you will see just how much I care when you see the G again. <laughs> G from you any day is better than anything. <laughs> I'll take a G any day, sir. Right, all right, all right, all right. Be careful what you pray for in my guy, you know, so go ahead. I know, <laughs> but that's okay, I trust you. <laughs> as, 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 as your colleagues know, G is for great, so you ain't, you ain't have a problem, you don't have a problem there. Nobody has ever gotten a G has something yet. Why are you not serious? I am serious about the G. <laughs> I mean, no, on a serious note, I'm going back to the Trinidad and, and what's happening. Oh my mm -hmm. God. What's happening Listen. in Trinidad yeah, today, as of today? What happened in Trinidad? Oh, you don't know? I'll forward it for you. No, 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 no. What, what, what is this? There's a whole set of shooting and rioting in Trinidad. Oh, you mean from the mobile killing? Oh, okay. It okay. kind of affected me because I had to get something put on the boat today, and that's how I end up knowing early. Oh, okay, 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 mm -hmm. okay. All right. Well, thanks, but I'll probably, you know, I'll probably call my relatives and see what is going on. But anyhow, yeah, thanks. Yeah. It's, it's serious, it's serious. Well, what is serious for Trinidad, you know? What's serious for Grady and might be serious for Trinidad. Really. <laughs> so I just, I just caution you with that. Now what this one serious, trust me. All right, okay. <laughs> All Locked right. down everywhere, all kind of thing. All right. Can they close down once it's a riot in one place and pick up another place? is really, really terrible. Okay. You know? all yeah. right. Kevin. All right. Fletcher, you had something to say? Okay, no. All right, guys. So thanks a lot, as usual. I enjoyed myself, even though you all may not have, but I had a grand time. Looking forward to talking day on Tuesday. So, bye all. I'm going to send, send the people back to the recording. Good night, sir. Bye. Good night, 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 Good of new equipment Good night, 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 and it's looking clear and nice. Yeah. Mm. So that she had a look up trend. You know, look at how so look at it. I'll pick up all that enough. So later. All right. Everybody good night. Okay.